It was a cold day in February. We had been in, in Marble, Colorado for a few days, and we slipped down the mountainside to a small town and the cinema. We stepped in to see a, a movie, but not before we stopped to get the Diet Coke and the popcorn. You know, the Diet Coke cancels out the popcorn as far as calories go. We, we found our seats, and that's not hard in an American theater because the seats aren't usually numbered and you don't usually have to sit in a certain place. And so we, we found a place where we could stretch our legs and, and lean back. Saw the credits, or saw the uh, uh, advertisements uh, of the movie, and, and then just as the movie started, something happened that startled me. I was sitting there with my hand in the popcorn when I started crying. And for the next hour and a half, tears just rolled down my face. I snubbed. It wasn't the movie. It started before the movie started. And, and, and you know, you, if you wipe your finger too close uh, to your eye after you've been eating popcorn, you get more salt in the salt water. Uh, it, was, it was one of those experiences where I, I said, where is this coming from? What's happening? But for an hour and a half, I just whimpered. When the movie was over, I hurried into the men's room so I could wash my face and look to see how red my eyes were because I didn't want anybody to know. You know, men are like that sometimes. They don't want anybody to see them cry. But we find tears were given to us by God. I have to admit, I, I haven't cried like that in years. But I've discovered that tears are little drops of humanity that crash down on broken hearts. Our, our tears uh, are feelings that carry, our tears carry feelings that our words are, are too crippled to speak. When I, when I open the Bible and, and, and search for tears, I don't have to look far. Joseph wept, and Joseph wept, and Joseph wept. He wept when he saw his brothers. He, he wept over, over years of brokenness in relationships. He wept when he saw his younger brother over unmade memories. He wept over what could have been but what wasn't. He wept with his father. He wept again and again. But he wasn't the only one who wept. When King David lost his son Absalom, he wept over Absalom. Absalom, Absalom, my son, would God that I had died for you. When Job's friends visited Job and they saw him, they wept. When Peter failed and denied Christ, he wept. And the shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. Would you say that with me? Jesus wept. Let's say it again. Jesus wept. This time let's close our eyes. Yes, you have permission to close your eyes. Now let's say it. Jesus wept. You can open your eyes. Everybody. We've all memorized a verse of Scripture this morning. Already, Jesus wept. When we open the Bible to John chapter 11, we generally pause on verse 25 where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, and he that believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. That's where we camp out. But I want you to, to notice some other parts of the story of the resurrection of Lazarus today. I want you to see the humanity of Christ. Jesus was friends with Lazarus and Martha and Mary. 
They were good friends. Lazarus, Martha, and Mary lived in Bethany, about two miles from Jerusalem, east of Jerusalem. And Jesus often visited in their home. At the time that John 11 records the story, Jesus wasn't in Jerusalem. He wasn't in Bethany. Jesus had gone down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He had crossed the Jordan River. He had entered what is called Jordan today. And he was in the area where John the Baptist had baptized many people and perhaps where Jesus was baptized. And there he was trying to retreat, but his efforts to retreat were not well received. Many people came to see him as he tried to get away from people and away from the crowds and prepare his heart for going to Jerusalem. Well, Martha and Mary became disturbed when Lazarus was sick, for Lazarus was quite ill. Martha and Mary sent word to Jesus, and the word was, Lord, your loved one is sick. He is ill. There are those who believe that the moment they said this, Lazarus died. We have no way of knowing that. What we do know is Jesus responded to them that this sickness was for God's glory. The disciples had no idea what he was talking about, and Jesus told them that Lazarus was uh, asleep. And they thought that meant that Lazarus was resting. And Jesus said, no, no, he's, he's dead. Now, Jesus delayed in going back to Jerusalem. But when he did climb the mountain and make his way toward Bethany, before he ever got to Bethany, Martha heard he was coming. And Martha scurried. She ran to meet Jesus. And when she did, she met him with words on her mouth that kind of betrayed her heart. She said, Lord, if you'd been here, our brother would not have died. Those words were an accusation. Those words betrayed anger. Those words showed expectation. Have you ever met someone that you thought could have made a difference after it's too late for him to make a difference? Have you ever faced a difficult situation where you, you said, if, if only... If only you'd said this, if only you'd done that, if only I hadn't done that, if only I hadn't said this. Most of us know the if onlys in life. We've wrestled with if onlys. Martha spews them out quickly. And she's very blunt as she carries her words, which is a characteristic of Martha. Jesus says to Martha, your brother shall rise again. And Martha responds quickly, I know he'll rise again on the resurrection of the last day. Now I want to pause here again. I want you to see the humanity here. Have you ever been disturbed about something and someone wanted to talk to you and to help you see it in a different way and you said, I know, I know, I know. We do that. We do that. My mind's made up, I know. When she says, I know, she's speaking of the Orthodox Jews' view that the resurrection will occur on the last day. And, and she's missing what Jesus is saying. And that's why Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me, even though he dies, he will live. Wow, powerful words. Startling words. When you're sick, you want a physician. You don't want to read a medical book. When you're hungry, you want food. You don't want to read a cookbook. When you're being sued, you want an attorney. You don't want to read a law book. When you are in need of transformation of the heart, you need a Savior, not simply printed words. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life to give hope to them. What does Mary say? She's still lost in her words. Yes, Lord, I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of God who's come into the world. 
and then she abruptly turns and walks away. She has the words of faith, but she hadn't processed them in her heart and in her soul. And some of us are like that. We know the right word to say about our faith, but we haven't processed it so it can attack or address whatever the situation is in the present moment. That's where she was. She goes back and she finds Mary, and Mary is wailing. And she's surrounded by comforters who are wailing. They're crying and, 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 and moaning. And they're deeply upset, even though Lazarus has been dead for four days. This was part of the culture and part of the way they handled things. Mary refused, or, or, or Mary was seeking to address her pain. The pain that Martha that Martha just kind of sloughed off. Mary gets up and she starts toward Jesus and she finds Jesus before he ever gets to the house. And what does she say? Well, she says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Lord, if, same way Martha began. But I'm not real sure she wasn't saying, why weren't you here? Why weren't you here? Have you ever said that to God? God, why weren't you here? Why didn't you answer my prayer? Why didn't you meet this need? God, why don't you look upon this the same way I'm looking at it? God, why don't you help me? If only you'd been here. If only you'd done what you need to do. In other words, we're, we're almost saying, Lord, I know you're Lord, but you don't understand what I feel. You don't understand where I am. You don't understand what I'm going through. You don't know me. Now, the language of grief often has anger interwoven within it. For anger is a very real part of grief. And when you face loss, whether it is loss of a loved one, loss of a job, a loss of something precious, anger is not an alien emotion. It is present. It is there. In this crisis experience, they're faced with death, which always reminds us of our mortality. It always reminds us that we're not in control. When death invades our ranks, we know, hey, I can't do anything. And the grieving process may occur in several ways. In the scripture, it is occurring through weeping. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Mary and the comforters are coming. Jesus could hear them before he could see them. They're wailing and weeping. They're distraught. But the Bible says Jesus was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Words that are closely connected with the concept of even anger. Why make that choice of words for our Lord? Because Mary is full of words, or Martha is full of words, and Mary is wailing. And the comforters are going through the cultural response. And all stand in his presence denying his power. They've already, already known the experience of Jesus raising the widow's son and Lazarus' daughter. But they don't connect that with their crisis. So often when we come in our crisis to God, we don't connect the power of God to our helplessness and our hopelessness. And that's exactly where he stood. But... The Word of God brings to us a Word of Jesus which is beyond the scope of our imagination. 
Jesus says, where have you laid him? And, 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 you know, they say, come and see, Lord. And the Bible says Jesus wept. Did he weep over, over the death of his friend, knowing full well that he was going to raise him from the dead? Did he weep over the sight of death, knowing full well that sin causes death, and within a few hours, few days, he would die for our sin, that death would lose its sting, that death would lose its victory. Why is he weeping? The scripture speaks of Jesus weeping. It's not Jesus wailing. It is talking about Jesus trembling, shuddering, weighed heavy with grief, but not making a big scene of his grief. And in this word, you see something John forecast in the first chapter when John said, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That which is God became fully man. That Jesus walked fully God, fully man among us. We see the humanity of Jesus Christ painted with clear picture here in the hand of John. Isaiah would call him a, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Isaiah would say to us, in all their distress, he was too distressed. He got in touch with his emotions, and he allowed his emotions to be seen. You know, the Old Testament has a, a, a very interesting passage of Scripture that David writes. David, in the time that he wrote it, was fleeing from Saul. And, and Saul was out to take his life, to get his life. And, and David is, is filled with tears over brokenness for this. And, and David writes, You keep track of all my sorrows. You've collected all my tears in your bottle. Even today you can buy tear bottles in, in Israel to collect your tears. Although some people need bigger bottles than others. You've recorded each one in your book. Each one. In other words, you know what's happening. You know what's happening. You understand our grief and understand our tears and understand our brokenness. Steve Lopez, Lopez writes uh, 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 articles from time to time in the Los Angeles Times. He wrote some time ago about a barber in Los Angeles whose son grew up and and wanted to be a policeman and found an opportunity to train as a policeman and to go to work as a policeman in Houston, Texas. And so his son went down to Houston and, and studied there, became a policeman. And almost as soon as he reached that goal, it was discovered that he had cancer. And in time, the young man died. Lopez steps into the story when the body is brought back to Los Angeles and the barber father wants to cut the hair of the son before the funeral. He goes to the funeral home. Lopez happened to be with the barber, his friend. And as the barber cut the hair, Lopez was captured by the tears streaming down his face the hands shaking that the father could give the son one last gift of his expertise. And he called it a meeting of the beauty and the beast. The beast death had robbed the father of this ongoing relationship with his son. But the father's love was reaching into a pivotal moment to give the son a gift one last time of a hair trim. The beauty and the beast. And when we step into John 11, what we step into is Jesus seeking to raise the beauty out of the beast death. He is seeking to raise life again. You know, 
as Jesus stands there weeping, his tears are releasing the pent-up emotions. And I want to pause here for just a moment. I know that studies show that women cry more than men and that men in many cultures say we're not supposed to cry. But I want to talk to you for a moment about the way you're made. Every one of us is made with intellect, emotions, and will. All of us. When it comes to emotions, all of us have emotions. Tears are one way we express our emotions. There are good ways to express emotions and bad ways to express emotions. And some of us who take pride in that we, we don't cry have been absolutely outrageous in the way we express our emotions to other people. For when we're hurt, we react with angry words and sometimes slapping people around, demeaning people, because we haven't learned to properly process our emotions. I don't cry, but I'm really a monster when I express my emotions. Now, guys, that's not healthy and it's not right. You don't have to hurt anybody to prove that you're a man. You don't have to cry all the time. But you do need to realize that while you're stuffing your tears, those emotions are going to come out somewhere else. That's going to happen. And because you prayed and asked Jesus Christ to forgive you for your sin and to be your Savior, you have submitted all of your life to Christ, including your emotions, the good ones and the bad ones. They're under the Lordship of Christ. Therefore, the way you express your emotions is under the Lordship of Jesus Christ and is accountable to Christ. I pause in this message to say this. You may cry, you may not cry. But you will express your emotions. As a person who walks with Christ, I charge you to consider how you express your emotions and do the expression of your emotions in a Christ-honoring way. That is a critical statement in building people and in communicating how we're made in Christ's name. Now Jesus, after he wept, he says, take away the stone. And I love Martha's reaction. I mean, she's right on quick. But Lord, by this time there's, there's a bad odor. He's been dead for four days. In other words, he stinks. Death always stinks. There's no way around it. But... Like the father fighting his tears to, to hold back and, and reach into the life of his son, Jesus steps forward and says to Mary, Did I tell you that if you believed, you'd see the glory of God? Lazarus, come out. Now, they move that stone. Lazarus doesn't prance out. He's wrapped in grave clothes. He's going to have a hard time getting out. You know, you can't walk very fast or quickly any direction. You can't even scratch your nose. They have to unwrap him. And they unwrap what they wrapped in death, they unwrap in life. 
I looked at this passage of Scripture. I wrestled with this passage of Scripture. And, and I, I came back to say, with the writer of Ecclesiastes, there's a time to weep and a time to laugh. And it's amazing how close those, time, those feelings are to each other in the way our emotions are strong. The psalmist gives me hope as he invites us in, in Psalm 34 with these words, is anyone crying for help? God is listening, ready to rescue you. If your heart is broken, you'll find God right there. If you're kicked in the gut, you'll, he'll help you catch your, your breath. Disciples so often get into trouble still, but God's there every time. You may say, why are you talking about these emotions today? Because I live in Hong Kong. And I've walked among the people of Hong Kong. And in the crisis we find ourselves in, in our city, I see a deep sadness in the people who love Hong Kong. There is a fear of what could happen, but there's a sadness over the process in which we find ourselves. A sadness that reaches into people regardless of their persuasion or their particular interest in this time. I want to come back to something I said earlier in the message. When our emotions become involved in the issues of life, they will find a way of expression. I am speaking to you about that which breaks our heart in our city. And I'm reminding you that your brothers and sisters in Christ, through your commitment to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and the way you handle your emotions in this difficult time, should be related to your commitment to Jesus Christ. The emotions you feel as you read, as you see, as you walk, as you talk, as you listen, the emotions you feel are real. You may see them in expressions in the way you treat people and they seem unrelated but they're not for often what we experience over here has a way of addressing what is over here that's such a true statement in the counseling room please listen to your heart Lift your concerns to God and allow God to help you in the expression of your emotions, your feelings, your opinions. And His expression will not be destructive to people, but will seek, I hope, to bring healing and peace. Pray with me. Is anyone crying? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. There are many of us whose eyes have eyes which have watered, hearts which have broken.
We lift our hopes to you. On broken wings. And we know you see yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And nothing we have or or will experience is a surprise to you. We ask you to help us to pay attention to our hearts, to our feelings. that we may act out of who we are in Christ rather than react out of how we've been hurt or how our hopes have been dashed. or out of our fears. We are yours. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.